Hello, and welcome to Religion and Life. I'm your host, Ozzy Oswald. When we hear words like sin, atonement, reconciliation, and fidelity, we often think about religious systems and theological thinkers. However, philosophers also are concerned about concepts such as these and build philosophical system of ethics and morality upon these and other principles. My guest today, Dr. Matthew Faust, is a philosopher and expert on the American pragmatist Josiah Royce. He'll help us understand the difference between what a philosopher means by such concepts as loyalty and how a theologian might treat the same topics. Welcome, Matt. I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, not to mention an honor. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I want to introduce you, Dr. Matthew Faust. Um, we call you Matt around the department. Uh, brand new faculty member in philosophy and religion and department chair. So you were hired to come in and uh, lead the Department of Philosophy and Religion. And um, you're off to a brand new and great start. And uh, we welcome you to Boone and to Appalachian State University. Thanks very much. Yeah. It's certainly great to be here at App State and uh, wonderful to be leading a department of philosophy and religion. It's great to be a member of a dynamic bidisciplinary department mm. that takes seriously these intersections. Yeah. I, th I thought maybe we would start just by allowing you to introduce yourself a little bit um, to the university community and to uh, the Boone community. Um, you know, tell us what you're interested in, what your research interests are, what you're teaching, um, and maybe a little bit about your goals for uh, philosophy and religion as, as disciplines within the university context. Sure. As an undergraduate, I attended John Carroll University. It's a Jesuit university in the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland is my hometown and very important to me. And uh, perhaps we'll have occasion to talk about how... I was going to say, we're going to come back to Cleveland, <laughs> the right? City of Cleveland <laughs> figures into my research. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, at John Carroll, at the time, every student was required to take three philosophy courses and two religious studies courses. Every mm. single student. Wow. Right? So it was in the course of fulfilling my requirements mm. that I came to see that philosophy was really animating something in me that other disciplines weren't. I mm. started as a communications major. Uh, found that content was interesting to me, but philosophy uh, really triggered something in me that made me feel more alive. Right. And I listened to that. Uh, so the natural next step was to go on to a master's program, which I did at Texas A&M University. And there I took a deep dive into the classical American philosophical tradition, uh, of which Josiah Royce is one member, mm -hmm. uh, not one of the most famous. Uh, historically one of the more marginalized figures. Mm. But there was a lot in his thought that I found quite valuable and worth exploring further. And following my master's program, I went to the PhD program at the University of Oregon, where I got to work with a specialist in Royce. Uh, there aren't many of them, right. uh, but I, I trained under one of the best and perhaps became one myself. Yeah. And so you know, from that time, I've worked at a few different institutions, uh, one in China, one in South Carolina, one in Connecticut before I landed here at App State. <laughs> uh, and along the way, I picked up a penchant for administrative work and uh, was a chairperson at my previous institution and attracted to the opportunity to come here. And as I said, work in a bidisciplinary department that takes seriously the connections between philosophy and religious studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to admit that uh, prior to reading some of your work on Royce, that I, I knew the name, but I wasn't very familiar with Josiah Royce, and I've enjoyed uh, learning a bit about his approach um, and, and some of the concepts that, that you're dealing with. So we'll get to talk about that in a little bit. Um, um, maybe before we go right to your work, uh, I mentioned some of those concepts that to me sound like uh, what we would read if we were reading theologians or if we were reading uh, religious studies scholars talking about religious systems, um, concepts like sin and redemption and loyalty. Um, you don't often, or I don't often think about philosophy when I'm thinking about those topics. Is this unusual for Royce to be um, exploring uh, concepts like this? Um, and, and how might philosophy approach these topics differently from, say, theology? Mm -hmm. Well, historically, there have been philosophers who were quite deliberate, placing themselves in a theological framework. Mm. Soren Kierkegaard immediately comes to mind. 
mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who wanted to uh, reform ideas that were current in the thinking of the church in his time and day, uh, Copenhagen, uh, one of the earliest existentialist thinkers. Uh, but Royce is interesting insofar as he uses Christian concepts, or con uh, concepts that we would readily identify with Christianity, but will explicitly say that this is a, a useful and familiar vocabulary and while what I'm saying applies to Christian communities, it so too applies to all communities potentially. Right. Right. So he definitely wanted what he had to say about sin, for example, to translate to a secular audience and thinking about immorality more generally. Right. Yeah. So just because he uses language that Christians would recognize, uh, we should not think to place him into that context that is a much more universal kind of bent to the way he would treat these concepts. Right, if we were making a list of philosophers who were Christians or philosophers who focused on Christian concepts or problems, he should be included on the list. Right. However, <laughs> uh, he should not be included exclusively on that list. He yeah. should be included on other lists. And I, I think that it, there's some importance to the context, you know, uh, he's a part of, I said, the classical American philosophical tradition. To call it classical would imply that it was popular. And at the time, turn of the 20th century, a number of philosophers in this tradition were household names, at least among mm -hmm. intellectuals. And uh, among those are John Dewey or uh, Charles Sanders Peirce or William James, who in mm -hmm. fact was his next door neighbor. Oh, really? Uh, that's yeah. right. And William James, a lot of your viewers may know, he was the author of a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Royce was very much in the shadow of these thinkers, and he spoke the language, but then again, he had this intention to cast a wider net. However, because he spoke this language, because so much of it was couched in the terms of Christianity, he may have perhaps limited his audience. Mm. I think a lot of the secular audience that he intended may not have listened as closely to him as he would have hoped. Right. Yeah, I often see his name attached to William James and mm -hmm. the varieties of religious experience is a classic, but I didn't know they were next door neighbors. So. Absolutely, yeah. on yeah. Irving Street, and, and <laughs> they, they, they used to have long debates over the fence. Oh, that's funny. As well, yeah. there was a neighborhood cat that annoyed James, but Royce was a cat guy. Yeah. And that may be also part of why I'm drawn to him. I, too, am a cat guy. Okay. Well, <laughs> and you're going, you're going to bring Royce now out of the shadow of James, and he's that's going to be right. a household name um, along with these other great things. That's my hope. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit maybe about some of these concepts. Um, so if, if you were to describe for this audience... Um, what Royce means by sin and redemption, for example. They're, they're kind of, you know, Christian uh, understandings of what those words mean, but uh, Royce is going to define them a little bit differently. So it might be interesting to hear how, what Royce would say about sin, redemption, and reconciliation. For Absolutely. Yeah. Royce thinks that sin is a product of our finitude. Mm -hmm. Well, to say that is probably to say something a lot of people would say. Right. Uh, now, how is it that we're manifesting our finitude when we sin? He understands sin as a deliberate, inattentive to an ought. This is to quote him directly. He's just saying, I know I ought not to do this, and I'm going to pretend that I don't know that. I'm suppressing attention to something which ought to be before my mind's eye. And by the way, it would always be behind, uh, before my mind's eye, were I an infinite creature, were I God. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so that's right. So sin is, is not something we do accidentally, it's something we do deliberately. Right. But it is this deliberate inattentiveness to something that we know we ought to be doing. Yeah. Right. So is there any sense that, um, that sin has a kind of social dimension? In other words, uh, I, I could imagine deliberately um, doing something that is against an alt principle, but then having no kind of social consequences. Does that come into play at all in his mm -hmm. thought about the, the, I guess, the, the, the results of, of an action? Yeah. It does. Yeah. Royce ultimately would reject the idea that I could be de deliberately inattentive to an ought and that it's only personal. Okay. 
every deliberate inattention to an ought, and for that matter, every deliberate attention to an ought carries social implications. Why? Because I'm fashioning who I am, and I am fundamentally a social creature. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that brings us to the point about redemption. The word that he'll more commonly use for that is atonement. Okay. Okay. And Which is also a Christian, uh, or a word that Christians would be familiar with, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I would just say, you know, Royce points to how this word is spelled out. Atonement is at one yeah. What does that mean? It means that when we perform acts of atonement, we're trying to suture back together something which has been fractured. And sometimes, yes, we are enacting a fracture in ourselves when we commit a sin. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we're enacting a fracture in a community um, in which we are a member. Those are the instances which he most directly was concerned with. And again, because ultimately he didn't think there was really uh, a totally private instance of a sin. Right, yeah. So the fracture in the community is, is the kind of result that that uh, comes from sinful actions, this deliberate inattention to an alt. Um, so does, does this at one or this atonement theory, um, does it absolve the person or does, it sounds like there's something more that there's atonement um, uh, targets working towards some sort of change within the community beyond the fracturing or is it, You're right. does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes plenty amending, of sense. Amending, maybe amending, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's just like a, a scar that could heal, uh, but, um, you know, the scar, the scar remains. The wound heals, but the scar remains, right? So uh, we may very well uh, succeed in performing acts of atonement. We've made up for the fracture that we enacted. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it's also the case that the fracture happened. We don't forget that. Likewise, though, uh, we don't have to dwell on it and mire ourselves, mire ourselves in it. It could be that we in our community become all the better mm. as a consequence of the atoning action, which never would have happened had the sin not happened. Right. Okay, so this is a somewhat radical view. I think some people might hear this as the suggestion that sin ultimately is good. And of course, he does not recommend <laughs> that we go right. about finding occasions to sin. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but once we do, it's, it's important to try to follow that inattentive attention to an ought with uh, an attention to an ought. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So the um, atonement itself is deliberate as well. Absolutely. Okay, all right. So it puts responsibility back on, on the individual to... to I, I guess not to right or wrong, but then to work toward at least mending the fracture in some way. Correct. Yeah. And to say a bit more about the social elements of this, not only does the individual who performed the sin or enacted the fracture in the community have a responsibility now to try to make amends, so too those who were fractured. Right? The community mm -hmm. has a responsibility to be receptive to and to work with the individual who enacted the fracture or committed the sin. That seems to me to be the more radical part. Okay. Uh, I mean, just from <laughs> listening to you, that the, the community then is given responsibility to work with the individual who's committed the wrong. I mean, that's, that's um, that, to, I'm going to have to think about that. Well, that, I mean, I, I like the idea, but it does seem to be a, a more radical departure than the other concepts if I'm thinking about it from say, a, a Christian theological perspective. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. But, you know, he might argue that to decide that we're unwilling to work with the individual who wishes to make amends is to ourselves decide to be inattentive to an ought. There you go. That's it. We're <laughs> very consistent then in that point. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's fascinating, I think. And we could talk all day about that, but I know that you want to talk about something else, and I want to hear you talk about something else, um, uh, the concept of loyalty. Sure. Um, and... Um, I, I guess this is where you think uh, Royce has something really special uh, to offer uh, the philosophical tradition. Um, and, and I read a very interesting article that you wrote about, of all people, LeBron James. Um, and uh, maybe you can just talk about um, what got you interested in how Royce um, is concerned about the concept of loyalty, why it's important, 
and how you worked it out in the context of the sporting world. That's fascinating. Sure, absolutely. This is what really drew me to Royce. It's that in answering the question, how should I live, he responds loyally. Mm. There are many possible responses to that question, and in philosophy we consider dozens of them. But he's pretty unique and that he publishes a book in 1908 titled The Philosophy of Loyalty in which he takes this risk and says what we need to do is foreground loyalty as the prime virtue is really distinctive. Mm -hmm. And from that point onward, this is his philosophical preoccupation. And he attempts to apply this theory of loyalty to a number of contexts, including the international relations arena. Okay, in 1914, he publishes a book called War and Insurance, in which he proposes an international insurance system that stems from his theory of loyalty, and it's intended to discourage nations from aggressing against one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it was not accepted. I don't know if you know that, but it, <laughs> it hasn't taken hold. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he was working on something called the hope of the great community. Again, mm -hmm. the great community being the international community, and that was published posthumously, you know, soon after he died, in the context of World War I. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I, I want to note this, that the term the beloved community, which is very popularly associated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right. It's Royce's. King was a reader of Royce. King read Royce. That's true. Really? Yes. That's amazing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've never heard that connection. I, I know some of, of what Martin Luther King Jr. read, but uh, never has the name Josiah Royce come up to me anyway. But, well, yeah. yes, it's true. Uh, so, uh. so Royce thinks loyalty is very important. But now yeah. someone could object. Can't we be loyal to bad things? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, Royce is aware of it. So it's not just that we should be loyal. It's that our loyalties should be loyal to loyalty. And here's what he means. I'm loyal to a given cause, and that particular loyalty promotes more loyalty in the world. It does not act to destroy or prey upon other people's ability to be loyal. Mm. This is how an example like his example is a robber band. That this group of robbers, they're very loyal to each other. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they're disrupting other people's ability to calmly and in an orderly fashion be loyal to their various causes because right. now they've induced fear. So loyalty is only loyalty to loyalty if it's a worthy cause. Yeah. But if it's if you're loyal to an unworthy cause then you're undermining the whole concept of loyalty. Isn't That's it? correct. OK. Right. right. So if I transport Royce to the 21st century and we think about the loyalty to a terrorist network or something like this. Yeah. yeah, he would quickly be able to address that by saying that instance of loyalty is disloyal to loyalty and so clearly rejectable on his theory. Mm -hmm. Now you've asked me how I've related it to the context of sport. Right. And sport, of course, is an arena for a lot of different feelings of loyalty. And I mentioned before, I'm a Clevelander. So I'm loyal to Cleveland teams, and for my life, that's been a difficult loyalty. <laughs> it's very difficult. It's not actually. It's not difficult to be loyal to these teams, but the payoff uh, often isn't there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the loyalty is tested quite frequently, uh, and so you know, uh, I wrote this piece on LeBron James's loyalty. Uh, where should LeBron's loyalty? Where should ours? To uh, think about at the time, his departure from the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2010, what was called The Decision. Mm -hmm. It was a decision which was aired on ESPN, and you know he kept us all in suspense about whether he would stick with us or he would move on to another team. And it was at that time that he announced he was moving on to the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. So using Royce's philosophy of loyalty as a framework, I gave an analysis of how we should think about LeBron James and his comportment to loyalty, as well as how we, fans of Cleveland teams, fans of LeBron James, loyal to our city, loyal to the team, loyal to the player, ought to be thinking about it. Right. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's very complicated. Uh, LeBron James himself uh, would say he sees himself as a role model. Well, what does it mean to be a role model? We're modeling how people ought to behave. So we should be attentive to our oughts, not 
inattentive to them. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. one of the oughts is to be loyal. Mm -hmm. So this is um, sounding a lot like the discussion we had on sin and reconciliation and atonement. Right. Um, there, there's an underlying principle here that these concepts can't just be ideals that we hold in our mind. There's a, an action principle, right? That we, we have to act on uh, mending the fracture for atonement and there has loyalty for it to be true loyalty has to have some sort of action component to it. Am I reading that correctly from what you're saying? You're reading it absolutely correctly. Okay. And I would add that James did return to the Cavs, of course, and in 2016, I got to witness <laughs> a championship yeah. from, from a major Cleveland sports team. Yeah. Now, he called his departure from the Cavs the decision. He did not call his return to the Cavs the atonement. <laughs> it's a shame, right? <laughs> it's a shame. Yeah, yeah. It would have been a great opportunity. Right. I, I, sometimes I really have wondered whether he read this piece that I published analyzing his loyalty and his departure yeah. from the Cavs and uh, wonder whether we could add him to the list of people who have read Royce. Mm. That's, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> now, in, in this piece, you, didn't, you never made a uh, judgment about whether James was being loyal or not. You're right. Um, and you, in fact, you never made a judgment about your own kind of, of reaction to him, but you, you put the principles out there and kind of I left did. it open-ended. So I'm not going to push you on that. Well, but. it's okay. I was coy. You're right. Yeah. yeah. I would have preferred, of course, for him to stick with us. All right. But there are many causes that we could ask him to take account of in, in asking whether ultimately he's being loyal to loyalty. Mm -hmm. And certainly there are factors I don't know because I'm not LeBron James. And it could be that he exercised some thinking much like Royce's, and in fact, his decision was indeed loyal to loyalty, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't know it. Well, that's true. And then the other, the other I think, sort of um, complicating factor here and, and, and uh, enriching factor, too, is that you bring up um, the issue of having conflicting loyalties so that there's never, well, at least in the case of LeBron James, um, in, in his announcement about his decision, um, he cited these kind of conflicting loyalties. So he, he, he has loyalty to Cleveland, uh, has loyalty to other sports teams, has loyalty to his family. So that complicates things, right? It absolutely does. Yeah. And that's the stuff of life. Right. right. So this is, again, why I'm so drawn to Royce mm -hmm. or to anyone who wants to talk about loyalty. Because I think some of the most difficult decisions we make are those in which we grapple with conflicting loyalties. Indeed. The decision that I made to move, to change jobs, right? right? It, it, of course, there are many loyalties at stake that had to be considered closely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I made the right decision. Uh, but it, it was one that absolutely took serious consideration yeah. of furthering causes to which I was loyal. So this, this framework of loyalty to loyalty um, from, for Royce provides a way to, to make these difficult ethical and moral decisions. Um, and it seems like he's pretty consistent uh, down the line here. So he is. Yeah. Um, is this why? Uh, so you you have I think characterized Royce as a pragmatist. Yes. Um, and you know when we talk about his ideas forming a framework for then making decisions and taking actions, that that, that makes sense to me that he's a pragmatist. That's right. Um, others I have read describe him as an idealist. So what's how would you differentiate how other people are reading Royce from the way that you're reading Royce? Here? They're reading him incorrectly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough said. Well, it, right. well here's what I would say briefly. Yeah. They're, they're choosing to emphasize some of his, a, a certain area of his philosophical influence. Yeah. Okay. It's true enough that he was steeped in the German idealist tradition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are many times upon which he'll quote figures like Hegel or Schelling. And so, you know, there's a stream there in Royce. And I think because he had disagreements oftentimes with William James, who's taken to be a prototype of pragmatism, uh, classically people have just kind of crystallized that contrast or that, that uh, debate between the two of them. Mm. Uh, and mm -hmm. so just determined that he doesn't follow the pragmatist trajectory. In fact, 
in his own writings, he calls himself a pragmatist. And I, I, this is what bugs me. I, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I think some of these claims are really indefensible if we just look at the text written by the figures themselves. Right. That's right. And so you're right to identify that strand. He's concerned with practical matters. And the American pragmatists collectively uh, dec decried what they thought to be a uh, movement away from practical matters in the philosophy of their day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's definitely compatible with that bunch, but his influences are many and varied and include German idealism. Right, okay. So I wanted to, to ask you one other question that, that um, interests me after reading your work on, on uh, Royce. Um, at times, um, it seems that there's a kind of teleological element in Royce's work, this idea that uh, not only individual human lives, but society as a general, general is working towards some sort of end uh, outcome, and that it's a progression, a, a progressive sort of uh, working for something. And then at other times it sounds like that the very facts of life and our, our finitude kind of disrupts that sort of teleological goal. Is there a tension there, or is Royce um, a kind of optimist in this sense? Well, he's an optimist, um, but I, I think he also thinks that life is inherently tragic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, the life of a finite being is such that within this life, at least, <laughs> we're not going to achieve it perfectly, right? And, and so there are these intimations that the goal may not be achieved here and now, but perhaps in some other realm. And, and this is an area in which we could say, okay, there's a strong affinity between Royce and various theologi theologians, and particularly of a Christian stripe. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the watchword for him is uh, there's a, a continual striving. I think okay. um, that, that's it. Li like life itself on a biological level is a continual striving, and he does talk this way in some texts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And there's a text uh, that he writes. He writes his own, you know, William James is famous for a tome called The Principles of Psychology. Royce wrote a book called The Outlines of Psychology. Mm. Okay, so he does it from a psychological perspective. Right. We strive, we strive, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the watchword. It's always in progress. There's always something more to do. And that's because we're finite. We, can't, we cannot hope to get it all done here and now. Right. Yeah, but actually, that's not a defeating thesis. That's something which is ennobling. Mm -hmm. I understand that this is the way life is, and I do the best I can with it. And how is doing the best I can with it for him? It's choosing a cause and uh, serving it as loyally as I can. A worthy cause. A worthy cause. A worthy cause. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Well, and, and you used a word just then, hopeful. Yes. Uh, so it, it, there seems to be a kind of element of hope or, or the way that term is often used um, with Royce. Uh, does he use that word in and of itself uh, to describe the human condition? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And earlier I mentioned the text that he was working on and which was published posthumously by his wife, The Hope of the Great Community. So he landed on that word as key for him. Mm. And he, he died in uh, his, his early 60s, mm. you know. So he would have, I believe, he would have expected to have some more time to work this through. And we might have seen the word hope appear in his published writings with as much frequency as the word loyalty. And we'll have to speculate, but I think that wouldn't have been an impractical uh, hypothesis to make. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the other, um, yeah, I, I know we don't have time to, to go here, but the other thing that that you work on, and, and I think you see some overlap here with Royce, is uh, uh, Chinese philosophy, Chinese thought, or Chinese religion. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's kind of you know, those terms are used the lines blur. Yeah. yeah. So um, just in, in the brief amount of time that we have left, um, how does Royce take you there to the, to the Chinese thought and, and what are some of the kind of overlapping uh, places there? I was fortunate to learn in the middle of my PhD program from a newly hired professor of Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so the connection was really clear. I was writing my dissertation on Royce's theory of loyalty, and I took a course on the Analects of Confucius. Right. And so I was seeing everything through Roycean <laughs> lenses. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and here it was, this concept of xiao, which is translated as filial piety. Right. Yeah, and, and that's a 
respect or reverence for one's family. But it's more than simply an emotion. Of course, as we've been saying about Royce, it's, it's always issuing forth in action, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so here's the link for me between uh, Royce's philosophy and Confucian thought is a shared concern for the centrality of loyalty in a life that's ethically lived. Right. And uh, in the Confucian context, uh, people oftentimes describe it as a kind of series of outwardly growing concentric circles, where at the middle is my relation to my family. And we move progressively outward to the various other communities that we inhabit. And the highest one, the outermost one, is how I'm situated in relation to the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And, And again, it all flows from the middle. If I am a filial child, I'm more likely to be a responsible adult. A good father will learn from a good, right? A good son will learn from a good father and become a good father and then become a good leader in their community and so forth. Yeah, so there's concentric circles from the individual to the cosmos and along the way is family, community, government. Yes. Um, uh, government's an important aspect of this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So do other people um, make this connection between Royce and Confucian thought or is this your um, original contribution here? Um, Royce and Confucian thought may be my original contribution. Others who I've seen in print are usually disagreeing with me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, they, they will agree with me, uh, but uh, perhaps add some layers that I didn't initially notice. Right. Actually, I totally welcome that, as yeah. well as disagreement for that matter. Well, I, I look forward to reading more on this because I, I find it fascinating. You, you've really, you've gotten me interested in a, a new philosopher now, so I'm going to, to go back and read Josiah Royce and, and uh, uh, read some more of your work too. So I appreciate you coming and sharing your interest with us. I, I, I think that uh, your work, not only your administrative work, obviously, but your scholarly and teaching work are going to be a great contribution to our department and our larger university community. So again, This is our welcome to you to Appalachian State University and look forward to uh, serving with you for many years. I couldn't be happier to be here, Ozzy. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Well, that's it for Religion and Life for this week. I hope you'll join me next week as we continue to explore the intersection between religion, culture, and society. Until then, this is Ozzy Ostwald. 